What's up, everybody? I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and welcome to another episode on the Right Mindset Podcast today. I am, by the way, this this guest has been with me uh, very long. He's been on almost every season, I think, except for the first. I, I would almost argue that he was on the first season. Uh, he just keeps coming back. I don't know what's going on. I feel like I, you know, in a former life, he did something for me, and he's like, "I'll do a favor for you now, and I'll come on your show and make it interesting." And I said, "All right, uh, why don't you do that?" So I brought on uh, a, a famous and uh, extraordinaire author himself, uh, Mr. Jody J. Sperling. Everybody. Woo! Hey! Uh, super, super glad to be back, man. And uh, certainly not a favor. I always enjoy conversations with you. Uh, you've been on my podcast three times. Uh, one of only two guests to do that. So um, definitely love talking with you, man. Excellent. And uh, is it because I pay you or no? <laughs> yeah, your fees are great. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jody, I, you know, uh, one of the caveats about coming on today is we're not going to talk about marketing. There's, there's six episodes dedicated to that yes. <laughs> in our interviews. I wanted to talk about writing, but um, yep. but I also wanted to talk about, uh, you know, our writing styles and our processes and uh, things like that. But before we get into it, let's start with something fun and let's let's tell the audience that, you know, we don't take ourselves seriously, uh, but we take ourselves seriously. So uh what is let's start with something fun what is one of the worst reviews you've gotten on a book that made you go hmm i don't know if i agree with it but i i appreciate this terrible review you know yeah you know there's there's a review out there a one star review on amazon that the guy said something to the effect of um i was going to take some books down to donate to the library but this one is so shitty i threw it in the trash can before i got there I was I was like, okay, well, you know, there you have it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's a review on the story. That's just an amazing moment in life. <laughs> like, <that's>, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I never what are your thoughts on bad reviews though? Like uh, before before you answer, like yeah, the thing I always never understood, I don't do this personally. If I don't like a book, I don't go out of my way to get if it's a three star or more, I'll write a review. Yep. But if it's two or one. I don't have the time as it is in my life, but like how bad or how much do you have to hate the book experience where you're like, I need people to know this is horrible. This is horrible. Yeah. Um, it's got to be different for everybody. Like you said, uh, you don't go out of your way to do it. And I think that that comes from a place of like caring about humans. And you're like, hey, even if this is a bad book, I'm not going to hurt that person. Yeah. Um, I'm very much like that, but I've had a bit of a, a, a up and down journey with how I do it. So I started using Goodreads before Amazon owned it. And I loved tracking my books. There's something like very comforting and satisfying in metrics. And so I was, I was logging stars for books from the beginning. And the way that I thought about it before I understood how the rest of the world was behaving was I'm going to give any book that I enjoyed, but that isn't going to stay with me for a long time, three stars. That seems like right there in the middle. It's good. I want people to read it. I might not recommend it, but it's good. Um, and a book that I think is great that I really enjoyed, I'm going to give four stars. And if I feel like I changed a little bit as a person because the book was so amazing and it's going to stay with me, five stars. Um, and then very, very occasionally, I felt like I had something to say about the book, regardless of any of that. And I might write a review, but I did a lot of rating, very little reviewing. Um, and then I was convinced by a close friend of mine. His name is Jeff. He's a great guy. But he was like, if you accomplished the feat of just writing a book, you don't deserve anything worse than a three-star review. And I for agree. a long time, I tried to abide by that because I was like, it's true. Writing a book is super hard. And then I came across a book called Clowns in the Cornfield and it was the breaking point for me. I was like, <laughs> I feel so badly about this book and how lazy the writing was and how horrible the story was that I have to let the world know, do not read this book. And it was cathartic <laughs> to write a one-star review. I, I did, did you throw the book out? <laughs> you know, thankfully I got it from the library. So I was able to <laughs> put it back, it back to the library. At least, at least I gave it back to the library. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't, you probably know a little bit about my background, but I, I did write uh, reviews and stuff for like newspapers and, and stuff like that on Long Island. Yep. And it's interesting because the editor is like, look, go in 
with the intention of writing a good review. Like that was always yeah. the notes go in yeah. with the intention of writing a good review. And then he'd be like, look, we're getting these tickets for free. Our job is not to beat up the story or yeah. the movie or whatever. Or if like I get to see a television show early or something like that. Right. And that got me into, uh, I, I call it binary, but there's really three variations. I either don't like it. I like it. Or like you said, this this moved me like this was amazing you know like I, i'm somebody new so whenever i wrote reviews if i didn't like it i had to at least write a three you know what i'm saying like i had to yeah. what did i like about it and and that actually started making me look at reviews differently too because it is hard to write a book it's hard to write a movie it's even harder to film a movie mm. let alone how hard it is to get the money to film the movie let alone how hard it is to get to distribute, right? So everything yeah. kind of got through the... Cra now, we might look at a movie and be like, this is horrible. But you know how many bad movies there were that didn't get made yeah, because they were terrible? So they're like... the It's like going to somebody go... Uh, where, where people are like, oh, I, I could be... Uh, uh, like an Olympic runner, right? Or an Olympic basketball player is going to be much better than, say, a college right. player. But a college level basketball player is still going to thrash like the best non college basketball players yeah. that haven't, you know, that are in that age range. You know, <laughs> like, yep. you, the difference is so huge. Yep. You, you know, and uh, I, I look at, I so I take books in the same account. Uh, uh, and I'm not knocking anyone who self publishes because I have self published. Self publishing is a way. But there is a difference between someone who at least goes the professional route as a self-publisher in the sense that they they get an editor. They put yes. the work in, right? Versus they wrote a book. It's my first draft. Of course, it's my first draft, so it's great. It has to be great because I wrote it, right? right. And, and then I'm going to release it. And they didn't put in the quote-unquote work. Yeah. To me, that book is equivalent to the person that's in high school saying they could beat a college-level basketball player. Yeah, absolutely. There's yeah. something that happens where I, I encounter a lot of self-published authors and I'll ask them what their editing process is. And you can tell really quick by the way they answer the question that if they've done anything, they've got somebody to proofread the book. Nobody went in and said, hey, I noticed like you mentioned this in this part of the story and it never pays off or this piece like dragged on a little too long, like no longer conversation to take that book and say, now go rewrite it with these suggestions because you have to deal with these things sitting under the editor going through all of those different drafts until you get something that's really truly polished and yeah. I, I think that a lot of self-published authors are missing that opportunity you also get into the uh the conflict of being an editor versus the writer where it's like yeah. the writer comes to you you give them those uh, exact notes you just said where this isn't yeah. paying off blah, 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 blah. and they're like well i like it how it is yeah and you're like well, why did you pay me <laughs> exactly like if you didn't want to change anything or you felt like this is literally your first or maybe second draft well because what i would that that's the other thing like when i run in client into clients and they're like um or just writers in general too let's be honest when mm -hmm. they say uh oh so you think i'm a bad writer and you're like no i didn't say that well you're saying that i need to work this so that means it's not good so therefore i'm not good and you're like right. but great writing is rewriting yes you you I'm like, did you even in the in the movie industry, when you write a script, your script goes through a lot of revisions and maybe maybe let's say you do five revisions and then you get to pitch it. All right. That that script is going to be rewritten once the studio purchases it. Right. In fact, if you did 20 versions of it, the studio is still going to hire somebody to revise it. In fact, Pretty Woman was purchased by Disney of all companies. And it was originally called $3,000, right? Because it was about paying $3,000 to the, yeah. and it had like a heroin addict in it and a death and a this and a that. And they hired someone else to write it. Right. And then, uh, Penny Marshall's father, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gar Gary, uh, who, who's, the, who's the guy who did, uh, Penny Marshall's Mr. Marshall, who directed the Mr. film. Marshall. <laughs> Mr. Marshall. He, uh, he 
basically was like, this new script is terrible. Why don't we hire the original guy? And Disney's like, but he's a nobody. And yeah. he's like, just hire him. You know, at least let him come on and like give notes. So they hired him again, and the script was terrible. They already purchased the idea. So what Gary, it is Gary Marshall. What he did do is he basically improvised. He was like, improvised the lines, and then he suggested. Th so not only was the script written several times, purchased, yeah. then rewritten several times, but while they shot it, they basically used the script as a skeleton. Yeah. And then, right. So, like, imagine Pretty Woman being the final draft of the script that was purchased the first time. It wouldn't be what we experienced. Right. And that's how people need to approach writing. You have to be fearless in the sense that, like, I am not good enough to not right. do the work. Yeah. You know? Here's something that's really strange. I don't even know exactly where it fits into the conversation, but uh, my first book, The Nine Lives of Marva DeLonghi, when I, I guess it's not the first book I wrote, but it's the first book that I took seriously. I shopped it. It was good enough that it got a literary agent. We did all the things you're talking about. Annie and I went back and forth so many times that it was like, this doesn't even feel like the book I originally wrote. Um, and we went out to a whole bunch of different publishers, You know, did that whole process. Um, and that is the book I would say that most readers have the, the least response to. So it tends to be good enough to get people drawn into the series, but the, the next book in the series, the eight ball magic of Susie Q, I wrote it from beginning to end in six months and had it ready and published in about six months. I went through an editor. We did two revisions on it. And then I bought a proofreader and we did that. And it was out after two revisions and a proofread. And constantly people tell me the eight ball magic of Susie Q is the best book in the series. It's really weird. I don't understand what I was thinking of as you were talking to pretty woman was the idea of overworking, which they didn't, that movie's phenomenal, but there also is an, an ability to overwork something. I've done oh, it yeah. with my own, you know, drafts before where I wrote something and I just could never quite figure it out. And I tinkered and tinkered and tinkered until it felt lifeless. Yeah, you definitely have to be able to say when, you know, and yeah. uh, when I was in the music industry, there was this guy, uh, it took him 16 years to record oh, yeah. one album. And it's wow. because uh, he went to a studio and then he was like, all right, it's recorded. He paid for the entire album to be recorded, which a couple thousand dollars back then because wow. it was not digital. Uh, yeah. Then while he was listening to it, he was like, oh, I want to change things. And he doesn't like the guitarist. So he gets another guitarist or he gets another. And then he goes back and he re-records those tricks. And then he's like, you know what? Uh, I don't like the mix. Wow. So then he started buying studio equipment and putting it in his house. And now he had the studio equipment. So then he just started re-recording everything because now he had the studio equipment. And one thing led to another and he was forgotten. All his yeah. sponsorship deals, all endorsement deals were gone because he was he was like a known musician on Long Island, yeah. but you have to release stuff. So the people who are paying for you to be a right. part of that system, they could start pushing you, you know? Um, so there is definitely a, when, you know, you have yeah. to be aware of the when, but I would also add the caveat that sometimes uh, writers will, will find an editor who just has the title editor and that editor yeah. doesn't have the same vision as the author. And those yeah. that is also very important. Yeah. I think that's extremely important. Because, again, like, you might be writing a story. I'm not a royal you. I'm, this is for yes. people right. out in the existence. You, as an author, might be writing something, and you're like, I want it to take place in the fantasy realm of dragons. And then the right. editor comes in and goes, you should really think about adding like a sci-fi element here. Like <laughs> they should like get teleported to another planet or something. And you're like, well, give me notes on this book. I am. I think, the, you know, and they start writing the book they want to see. Right. Uh, which also happens with like alpha readers or beta readers. Sometimes their yes. notes are like, you know, I really wish these two would like end up together. You're like the brother and sister. Oh, the brother and <laughs> sister. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But they have great chemistry. I didn't know they were brother and sister. Well, you learn that in the next book, but they're like, yeah, but they have such great chemistry. You should make them lovers instead. You know, yeah. Like, not, not brothers and sisters, lovers. Yeah. Lovers, lovers. Forget the brother or sister thing. I think it'd be better because I like, I like a good romance. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. 
All right. This isn't okay. a romance, but thanks for letting me know. I appreciate it. Did you see the dragon? <laughs> yeah. Um, was there ever a time when you were writing uh, one, one of your many books uh, where you said, without going to an editor, this is just you in the writing process, yep. where you're writing it and you go, this is not working. Oh, yeah. So How many times. Um, so there's there's a couple of things. Um, I have never outlined until I started the second book in the Luke and Time Mysteries. And so that actually happened to me fairly frequently before I started outlining. Because I would get like halfway into the book and I would start to feel lost. I don't know where this thing is going. I don't know how to get anywhere. I'm not even sure what the ending is. And it just felt so fake and contrived. And there were a lot of times that I would completely strip the book down and start over again because I didn't see any way to reconcile what I had. Mm. Um, something interesting that I've not heard people talk about before, but that has still happened to me, uh, even with the most recent book that I'm writing, is that like I will hate what I'm writing in the moment. And I'll be like, OK, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the book. I'm going to read the book and I'm going to figure out where did I go wrong? And the weird thing is when I do that, I will literally walk myself to the same place. I'll be like, this is good. This is good. This is good. All the way up until I get to the last page I wrote. And then I have that feeling. I'm like, it's broken. I don't know where it broke. Everything went right, but it went right to the breaking point. Like yeah. it doesn't make logical sense why that happens, but you love it right to the moment where you're like, "Frick, it's broken. So I've when... discarded plenty of projects for that reason. Um, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay throwing something away when I, when I feel like it's not doing what I want it to do. Um, mm -hmm. I've also been able to save a book. The Nine Lives of Marvin DeLong I started out uh, from the perspective of the main character, Lyle, instead of Luke, who now is the, the perspective character. And the main threat to the universe of the book was this genetically hybridized lice that preyed on black women. Um, only, you know, the hair of black women. And I was <laughs> trying to right yeah <laughs> i was I was old man to... writing about hair tragedy <laughs> <laughs> i know i wanted to explore race and gender and i thought this will be really fun and it was a terrible book um yeah but I kept character so it was a lot of people yeah thank you tell me how <laughs> <laughs> um, but i kept the characters and so there was a win there and, and then you know something much better and and i think much more enjoyable that still talks about uh race and gender quite a bit yeah. um resulted so yeah, I uh, I wrote a book about cats and oh. uh, how they're terrible animals compared to dogs. And really, uh, is this true? Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so the, the cats are really terrible, and dogs are better, right? And uh, oh. uh, no, <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. Make, I didn't write this book. <laughs> I just I just wanted to you know explore the world that I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Uh, there was a lot. There was a lot of pussy in that book, though. I'll be honest oh, with you. Absolutely. They're all cats. They're all cats. Yeah, they're all, and the they're dogs all were afraid. Um, yeah. There is something that I I do tell, like you know, between my friends or clients or any, just you know, other people in the writing industry. Like a lot of times, they're writing the book based on what they want to see, mm -hmm. or like things that they like, or they fell in love with something, and they're just like, that's why it's working because they're oh the thing i wanted in the book the the reason i'm writing the book in the first place that scene is here or this mm -hmm. character's here and this is how i picture them and sometimes they forget part of being a writer is is not necessarily writing what it is you want to happen but understanding how to allow the story to connect and make sense and evolve and sometimes the character you wanted turned like you said you had to change the pov right Yep. Sometimes you have to accept these changes uh, because you, you have to make a story work. Uh, yep. what, what's the thing? What do you think? I'm sure you've heard this before where people are always like, uh, the, the characters tell me the story. I'm not in control. I'm just transparent. Yeah. And it's like those characters are just giving you scenes. And yeah. then you have all these scenes, and but they don't connect. And it's like, how do you get? Well, well, you got to connect it. Sometimes you got to take some scenes out or you got to add scenes or you got to. Yeah. But then you got to think about like, why? what's the motivation what's this and it's like mm -hmm. oh i'm just writing the scenes out though mm -hmm. i'm just writing it how i'm seeing it and yeah it's great to be like you know what would be awesome this this huge scene scene piece you know but why yeah. is it there 
Why are the characters there? Like that's the part that makes a narrative good is the yep. why, the, the, the reason, the emotional response, the good and bad consequences. Not yep. we just saw a Zack Snyder film where Aquaman is drunk. He throws his bottle down on the rocks, walks to the edge of the rocks and the water splashes up. OK, but what's going on right now? Right. It looks amazing. But what's going I'm not I don't care. Yeah. You know, um, let me think. So I'm, I'm thinking about a knock at the cabin was a film version of a book with a similar title, but not quite the same title. And I can't remember the book right now. M. Night Shyamalan directed a knock at the cabin. Who's that? Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but many, many people question a lot of the things that he does for whatever reason. He's always worked extremely well for me. And this was actually the first film I'd ever seen by him that I uh, I walked away with a negative feeling about. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the reasons that I did, but I thought it was interesting because behind what you were just talking about was my discomfort of like, why? Why did we make this particular choice? It doesn't feel like it serves uh, the story. It doesn't yeah. feel like, yeah, it just, it, it was the first time I ever felt like he took a real, real misstep in, in the choice that he made. Um, I'm not connecting it perfectly back to what you're saying, but that just was this really strong sense I had that something went wrong. Um, and I wonder, like, tying back into the revision that we were talking about, did did that is that a case where you had a committee making a choice and the committee made the wrong choice or is that a case where the uh director in this case um said we're doing it my way i, I don't know that there's actually any proof either way but i i think m night and don't get me wrong there are a couple films i like of his but that doesn't yeah. make me a fan of him right you know because the happening happened uh <laughs> which is my favorite <laughs> oh. I know. I planted. I planted that seed in your head. All right. <laughs> please, please don't kill us. Oh, you're a plastic plant. Um. Uh. But I think he's he is one of those directors like George Lucas. Uh, no one tells him no. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, how yeah. can you? Tell, I know what I'm doing. I did the Sixth Sense. I did you know the Unbreakable. I did. I did signs like. I know right. where this is going. You're just not understanding my vision. And it's like, you can't really argue with that in a yeah. sense, because like it is, it's like arguing with Lucas on star Wars when he was filming it. Like people were arguing with him and he's like, no, trust me. And they're like, this is terrible. This is going to be terrible. And then it ends up being yeah. star Wars, you know? Right. And then they were like, well, the second one's coming out. So who do we, should we question it? Yeah. Cause we were all wrong and he right. was definitely right. You know? So, yeah. I think when Sixth Sense came out, they were like, all right, we got to listen to this guy. And then what was the one? What came out after? I forget what came out after that. Was it Unbreakable? Unbreakable. Yeah, it was Unbreakable. He did Sixth Sense and then Unbreakable. And in my opinion, both of those were stellar films. I mean, Unbreakable. That's what I'm is, saying. Like, yeah. you, can't, you can't say he doesn't. Because imagine filming being on Sixth Sense. Yep. And people are just like, what is going on here, bro? <laughs> and he's like, trust me. And they're like, yeah. okay, you know, like this is weird. You know, it's slow. It's, yep. it's melodramatic. You know, it, it's like, I don't get what's happening. And then like the ending, you're just like, whoa. Yeah. You know, and then you yeah. get, then you get the unbreakable. It's the same thing. What do you mean? They're superheroes, but they're not like, it's real world. Mm -hmm. Like it, this is also very slow. It's, it drags and I love unbreakable and I hate mm -hmm. slow paced projects. Right. So films. Even tell it I hate slow pace. Uh, yeah. Slow pace is good if it make if it's like filled with something. Yeah. That's why I like Unbreakable. There's there's something going on, you know. But oh yeah. But at the same time, I think the third the film after that was Signs. I think so. I believe and that's that was correct. the first time people were like okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're you're right too because and I mean it's been mentioned a million times before. But when you when you decide that the aliens have to leave because water is the bane of their existence. Like they're tech, like they have the technology to get the here, and they didn't. Yeah, there's water in the air, exactly. Like the fundamental thing, like they're gonna breathe it in and die. So he hung everything on a clever twist yeah. that couldn't work, and and yeah. retrospectively, it makes you angry. I still love the scene where Joaquin Phoenix is running around the house, and then he tells his dad to come out, and Mel Gibson says, "I'm gonna curse now," 
that's you know you just can't beat that scene <laughs> well, yeah there's always good moments and of course when the alien walks past the alley that's like such yes. a really good that's that was a very spooky moment you know the way he filmed yeah. it but you know the girl like, can i have a glass of water and then the water's all over the house and then yeah. like that's the twist you're right. just like all right yeah yeah, okay. she could have been an orange juice addict. They could have it could have been the specific pH of orange juice, and then he fixed everything. Yeah, something that's just a small <laughs> change, but uh, yeah, I, I I think he falls into the category of like, well, you know, he's M Night. He's, he's yeah, and you're like, eh, is he though? But he also wrote films that he didn't direct that were hits, I believe, as well, right? I think so. I don't know as much about the stuff that he hasn't directed. Like I said, I, I have he's kind of like my guilty pleasure. I like the happening. I liked um that one that's set in the the village off from oh it is it's the village wow the i look village. at that yeah oh, man. yeah that movie also made people go what what's what? happening exactly. totally what's i and i've happening? enjoyed all of it i think partly because there is something i enjoy about how obstinate he is and how weird his characters feel like there is not a character in any of his movies upon reflection that seems yeah. real all of his characters feel stylized yeah uh Yes, I, I agree with that. But he did also write Stuart Little. So you have to accept that. Uh, okay, I didn't you know, know that. The, the, you know, he's good at characters. Um, the Village, by the way, was after Signs. And this is what I mean. Like, yep. And then it was Lady in the Water. And then it was The Happening, right? Mm -hmm. So he. that's why like people were just like, what? And then what came after The Happening? Oh, the man. Last Airbringer. So, oh, and that, you're right. The Last Airbender is bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, bad. yeah. Yeah, and then you're like, we can't trust this guy. But then he came and he did Split. And <clears throat> people were like, this is great. Yeah. And then he did Glass. And you're like, all right, buddy, you got to take a break between things. You know? Something happened. He had he had a chance of having like a truly great trilogy after you do Unbreakable and Split. Like those two movies are phenomenal. They speak to each other. They're totally different, but yet they're in the same thing. And then I was so mad at Glass because it didn't finish well. Um yeah. Yeah, because Split thing. was its own movie that just so yeah. happened to be in that world. Yes. And then Glass was like, how do we bring it all together? Yeah. And you're like, the way they killed him in the puddle, I uh -huh. was like, I was like, have a nice day. Right. Exactly. I do agree with you on that. Uh, I was I was really I was really sad about that. That was how in Split was how I was introduced to Anya Taylor Joy. And I think that she's amazing um, in pretty much everything she does. She makes really, really good choices. Um, she's startling. She's, you know, everything that you would want. And I think a lot about her when I think about Luke Mia from my books. She's actually yeah, yeah. kind of like the the avatar that I use in my head when I think about that character. Mm, that's that's perverse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I loved her performance in Dune, too. I don't know. Did part I didn't two. get a chance to see Dune, but I've I've heard that she was good. Or are, are we th is it Dune or is it the it's well, Dune, she, Dune, she has a two second they just show oh, her next to the beach okay. and she just like looks at the camera like <laughs> no. <laughs> uh anyway, yeah. uh when you when you write about your character, right? Uh and you're writing love scenes, okay? Do you do you get aroused or, like do you have to? <laughs> no, this sounds like a joke, but like do you get into the mindset of the scene where you're like, how do I make it uh, provocative, uh, seductive, uh, sensual? Like, sure. how do you because you you can't make love to her because right. A, it's not your wife. Right. And B, uh, you're not the character doing the lovemaking and you're not a woman. So how do you get into right. those scenes without uh, having a thousand uh, bottles of uh, Baby oil <laughs> collected <laughs> from uh, P. Diddy's house. I mean, in in just in total truth, like yes, there have been moments where I'm writing and I'm writing a scene and it does get me turned on, and that's always an interesting feeling. And you know, you you get get a little hot and heavy there writing. I have definitely had those moments. Um, there's a moment in the Nine Lives where it's towards the end of the book and Luke and Lyle are have broken into a character's house because damn it, they're going to beat the truth out of him. Um, and while they're, while they're waiting for the person to wake up after they've knocked them unconscious, they make a sandwich and I described the sandwich, like it's lovemaking. Um, and that was, that was, that really, you aroused. <laughs> well, that one didn't get me aroused, but when I wrote it, I was like, I want this to feel, I want to use the same kind of sensory experience and talk about all of these things just the way you would, if you were talking about a sex scene. And I want it to stand in for that and feel like that. Um, 
And then there's a kissing scene in the third book, the 24 seven of a Russian named Dreskov, where uh, they are hiding out. And um, just, just as they're about to lean in for the kiss, they're attacked um, ridiculously by rocket launchers. And so cool. like the moment they're about to kiss, like things explode and it's concussive. And it was fun to write that moment of like, is this what it's like to kiss the person that you truly love? That was a lot of fun for me. Um, so I do like to try metaphor. Unfortunately, if I were going to criticize myself, I would say I'm closer to Haruki Murakami in the way that I deal with love scenes is that like, I am not a romantic person um, in the strictest sense. And so I'm probably detached from my own sense of romance in many ways. And so probably people who like to read um, hot and heavy scenes probably feel like mine are a little bit mechanical. I'm not mm -hmm. upset with that, but that probably is the truth, is that probably my my intimacy scenes feel a little bit more mechanical. Uh, yeah, I know that the feeling like whenever I write about there's this guy who takes his hand, right, and he sticks it into a mud hole. And like, that's when I start thinking about sensuality <laughs> and connecting yeah. it to... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, peanut butter <laughs> and anal. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, forever. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> forever. Uh, the, my memories of love. Uh, in the mud hole. <laughs> in the mud hole. Oh, it goes up to my elbow. Um, <laughs> something feels wrong here. Uh, you know, what's interesting is uh, I had someone read a, a book or chapter and there's like a, a quote unquote sex, not a love scene it is a sex scene. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and they're like, Oh, you should get more descriptive. You should write. And they were talking about making it more erotic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm not writing erotica. And they're like, well, I like erotica. So you should. And I was like, all right, well, I'm not going to do that. But what I noticed was when I write any scene or any moment, the thing that's happening needs to tell the story too. So sex can't be sex because they need to make love. Right. Or they need to have sex. And when I did that scene that that person read in the chapter, I normally would not have described how uh, obscenely uh, disgusting the uh, intimacy was, you know, how aggressive it was. Not that it was uh, a grape or anything. It was true. It was it was just BTSM, you know, and it was consenting yeah. adults with it. But the character who was experiencing witnessing it is uncomfortable yeah. with that kind of intimacy. And it was, and they were, you know, they were, it was being experienced through them. So I, I described it as it was uncomfortable instead of going through the POV of the people enjoying it, which is they were enjoying it. Right. So right. we didn't get to experience their POV. We experienced, so whenever that character who's uncomfortable with that level does make love, I don't have to go into the sex scene because it's more important the going in and then yeah. the aftermath. So then I don't do the love scene. I do the going into it. Yeah. And then I do the aftermath of the love scene because yeah. the touching part is like, it's like, look, I'm okay with nudity, uh, especially mm -hmm. being in the industry, but I'm not, I always hate like the butt shot. Like why uh, are we filming her butt? Mm -hmm. They're making love. His hands aren't even near her butt. His face isn't near her butt. Like, did you ever see the show Girls? No, I don't think so. There's a, I believe it's from Girls. There's a scene where the guy basically, uh, she's she's like against the sink and her butt is to his face and he's going at the butt. And you're like, all right, well, I get this shot. He's doing something. Shot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rimming it, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so I get it. I, I understand why we're we're see we need, we're seeing this. It, it it's uh. I think for those characters is out of character for them too. Like they were trying to spice it up or something. Cause like yeah. something was going on with their relationship. So narratively I was in right. But like when people are like just naked and they're like in the bed and it's all those like 1980s or late seventies sex shots where mm -hmm. it's like, here's the foot, here's the butt, here's the boob. And you're like, but it's not telling a story. Right. So even in novels, like I get a little weirded out by even violence that doesn't make narrative sense. Like if it's just, unless of course I'm going to see nightmare on Elm street, like I, the violence is yeah. necessary, you know, like, and it right. doesn't have to have a story. It's just right. these kids have to die. Like, yeah. That's, that's what I, I was thinking about that too. Um, I mean, my wife is a, a, she just a prolific reader of romance 
And you have to hit those moments so where there's there's the very descriptive sex scene. And you can flip to the three quarter marker of any one of those books and you'll find the sex scene. And, you know, there's formula involvement that you have to do. And that is an accepted part of the story. It's why people go to read it is to see these characters have their struggles and then, you know, make love and you get to see like all of it. Um, yeah. I, yeah, it's never it's never done a great deal for me. I think when it's done well, it certainly has been um, additive to the story. And if you're reading a romance, I guess you maybe expect that. Yeah. But then I also think about Dexter. When Dexter came out as a TV show, they intentionally had scenes at like strip clubs or they would find ways to have naked women in the show. And I, I am positive that they did that because they wanted to define themselves by crossing the typical barriers and boundaries. They wanted people to see it as gritty and dark. And that was a way that they could achieve that effect um, fairly cheaply, but possibly it worked. What, what do you think about that example? Well, I'll, I'll mention, I'll, 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 uh, I'll speak on the Dexter thing, but I just want to go back to the, when it comes to genre expectations like erotica, like you, yep. you would like that to me is not out of place because it's right. erotica yeah. or romance. Like you, like you need the happy ending. You need the love scene. You like yeah. all that is narratively purposeful to the genre. But when it's yeah. just like, you know, it'd be really great if uh, we so showed some boobs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which goes to the next boobs get ratings. <laughs> it's I, I'll, I, I'll talk about the Dexter part with, Game of Thrones. Okay. There's a moment when Littlefinger is telling his story about when he loved her and when he was a child. And then there's these two girls like finger banging each other. Oh. And they just made that. That was the first scene that created sex, sex position. So they just didn't want him doing this monologue. So they had these girls, hmm. the prostitutes, doing sex stuff. And he's yeah. just sitting there. And I remember Caitlin when she was so beautiful and I loved her. And I swore that. I, and then they're just like, <laughs> you know, and there's just stuff going on. Uh, and it's just so weird because their thing is not adding to the scene. It's just boobies. You know what I'm saying? It's just yeah. what can we get them to do sexually? So that's what I feel about like the Dexter stuff. Like if it's just yeah. there to be like, boobies. Yeah. What are you doing? Like, yeah. Why are you doing this? Like, yeah. I want to see boobies. Who doesn't like boobies? <laughs> but when I'm watching a story, it's like, here, here's a real good in person example. If I'm hanging out with a girl that I like and she's like, here's my boobies, I'm like, woo. But like, if I'm just walking around trying, or I'm having dinner at a restaurant and like three girls come over to me and they take their boobies out and stick them on my face. Yes. That's an experience. I'll remember for the rest of my life. Yes. They were boobies in my face, but wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, it's, I, I just think there's a, and don't get me wrong. I, I'm a comedian. So I have, I don't think there's a line per se. Yeah. Uh, uh, but at the same you, time, talking about being sense. intentional. Yeah, yeah. There, yes. Like th again, if I'm telling a joke to hurt someone's feeling or specifically to be an a hole, I'm not being funny. But if I'm telling a joke with a purpose and to get you to think, and I'm actually really saying something deeper than that, then I could do a Parkinson's joke. Yeah, uh, because we're 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 making something, we're being evocative, but we're also making you think. You know. Yeah. Anthony Jelinek. Is that, that's his name, right? Jes Jeselnik. Jeselnik. Thank you. Yeah. yeah he, he's, he's a guy who obviously is going for like the most offensive jokes possible. And he's built an entire <laughs> brand around it. Yeah. I really do really like him. And then sometimes I do think like, mm, you know, shocking. And so you kind of laugh, but you laugh uncomfortably. He does it better than anybody else I can think of. But yeah, w when you play with that line, like sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because his jokes work when I think something is happening, but his jokes don't work when he's just like the punchline is I slept with my dead uncle, and you're just like, okay, yeah, right, right. And I think that comes back to writing. Like one of the notes I give to my clients all the time because everybody does it, and it's going to happen in a first draft, a second draft, and sometimes in a third draft. I say, listen, stuff is happening, but nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. 
right? And because you have to have things happening, but something has to be happening also. Right. And uh, uh, to to explain that, it just very simply, you know, describing a room. Right. Where something is happening, but nothing is happening. You know, a character. <clears throat> Let's say a character is uh, eating breakfast. Yes, something is happening. Right. But nothing is happening. And that might even go back to our the, the previous thought we had, which is a sex scene. Yes, something is happening, but nothing is happening. And you got to add value to it. You got to add plot. You got to add character development. You got to add world building, right? You have to allow it to move those because <clears throat> that's the rule, right? Every line in your book has to do one or more of these three things, plot, character development, or world building. Yeah. If you could relate those to anything else, then description is interesting. Sitting and eating a sandwich is interesting. A love scene becomes interesting because if it's moving the plot, developing a character, or adding to the world, you are doing something. Yeah. Hey, well, let me ask you a question. This is uh, it, it. what you're saying drove me to something that is – like crazy practical to me right now, but that I, I don't understand. I consider myself to be fairly good at telling stories. And I think I tell good stories in novels, um, written some, some published short stories. So I've gotten affirmations from people outside my world that I'm doing it well enough that they care. And yet when it comes to trying to tell micro stories, which I think micro stories are probably the, the best currency out there right now, I really, really struggle. I don't understand how to tell micro stories and make a 30 second or 45 second reel. Um, I'm so blind to it that the things that I make, I think are good. And then I put them out there and they're not appealing. How, how do you think of stories in that really small format? Why is somebody like Edgar Caret so good at writing 500 word uh, flash fiction pieces? Like what's happening? I, I don't think I understand. Maybe you don't know either, but it's oh, just no, something I that I puzzle a whole lot. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, setup, midpoint conflict, resolution. Yeah. You have to look at that for everything from character arc to scenes to chapters to full stories. So even if it's a short story, there is a scene. If there's one scene or two scenes or three scenes, every scene has to have a setup, a midpoint conflict, and a resolution. The character in itself within that narrative has to have a setup. A mid and the reason is because the setup brings us into the scene. Yeah. I walked into the... Um, <clears throat> I walked into the funeral home, stepping past each one of these blank faces that I haven't seen in 10 years. That's the setup. Where are we? We're in a funeral home. I make it to the casket. Looking down at my father, his face still and un unable to speak back to me, wishing I could hear his voice. Right. Like now we're in the midpoint conflict. We're dealing with the struggle, the emotional truth. Yeah. Right. Like. And then you need, and then literally the next line can be something as simple as I kneel down. I said my prayers and my final goodbyes to my father as I turned and walked out. That's a full story. <clears throat> right. It has, it, 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 there is, there's literally a character arc. They, they had their closure, right? We set up why they they, we set up that they haven't talked to people. We set up, it's a funeral. We set up, it's the fall. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like every even if you go down to like a 30 second or a 15 second reel. Right. Yeah. There's still a story where you have to. That's why, like, I I personally don't like it, but it is it's what you kind of have to do in quote unquote marketing. But I don't want to get into marketing. Yeah, I'm not talking about well, marketing. I'm talking strictly <laughs> about the actual storytelling of it. I, I truly do not want to talk about the, the marketing side of it, but yeah. like the story. I don't get how to tell yeah. that story. But like in a reel, some of the strongest reels, even when they're just like joke reels, they have a setup as that creates the premise. Right. And then they have the event, which would be the midpoint conflict. Right. And then they have the resolution. So if you watch any reel, just try to figure out what is being what is the premise. Right. That's set up in the literally the first two seconds. What is the conflict? Which which what do they actually do? Yeah. And then how did they they how did they close it up? And uh, even even when I had to do like I had to like write commercials and stuff like that for like radio stations and stuff like that. Yeah, you have to set it up. You have to have you have to make something happen. Well, look at a commercial for uh, like cereal. The setup is breakfast in the morning. The the box is out. 
there's usually a parent and a child or children that run into the kitchen. The setup is it's the morning. They're hungry. The conflict is how are we going to feed them? Well, but mom, I don't want to eat this. It's too, it's too sugary. And they're like, what about Cheerios? It has honey delicious. And now they're right. And then the resolution is they're all eating the bowl of cereal. And there you go. That's the story. Yeah. It's set up complex. So you have to approach it with that mindset. And some, and, you know. some seem so good and some, so like, and again, let's just talk story, but I'm thinking about Dave Portnoy. Um, I've gotten stuck watching his reels too often because it's really predictable from what you're talking about. Guy standing outside a pizza shop, holding pizza box, oh, yeah. you know, the rules takes a bite of pizza, talks a little bit, takes some more bites of pizza. Like I know exactly what's going to happen. And then he's going to rate the pizza and story. Like I get the story structure there. Yep. There's something good about it, but there's also something that's a bit of a letdown. I'll watch five or six and be like, why did I watch all of these? I don't feel satisfied versus um, I don't remember the guy's name, but he cooks things and he often mm -hmm. uses the Lord of the Rings um, the from Hobbit and that particular soundtrack in the background. Yeah. And he talks about cheeky burritos. And at the end, he scrim, scram, screw them. Um, like there's something very predictable about the reels that he creates. And I love watching those. And I'll watch those for a long time and feel really happy seeing all the different things he's creating. There's a, a sense of story, but I don't know how to I don't know how to recreate those stories where they matter for something that I'm interested in, because well, the they, last thing I want to do in these stories is be heartfelt. I literally don't want to be heartfelt. I want to make you laugh and I want to find that story that that's like well, funny. The, the laughter is heartfelt. The laughter is the emotion. Right. So uh, yeah, if, if that word is the wrong word, I guess what I'm saying is. I don't want to impart wisdom to you. I just want you to have a good time. I want you to feel like that was fun. That was a worthwhile experience. Well, remember what I said earlier, I where like nothing is happening. Like something is happening, but nothing yeah. is happening. That's something that happens has to be emotional. Yeah. There, ha there, ha you have to be you saying something. Laughter. Like even with comedy, you have to be saying something. And it doesn't have to be educational, but it has okay. to be saying something. What Mike, about the one going not Mike Portnoy, even though Mike yeah. Portnoy had Rum of Dream Theater. Uh, Dave Portnoy, you remember who oh, he is? Oh, thank you, Dave. Oh, is it a different Dave? No, okay. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry. No, I said Mike Portnoy by accident yeah. because I'm okay. a Dream Theater fan. But you said Dave Point. But yeah. Dave, uh, the <clears throat> first of all, he, he is providing a solution yep. to a problem. Absolutely. Right? You know, the pizza, I want to know. But the emotional connection is, will he like, is that the kind of pizza I would like? And that's subconscious. Because you're watching to see if you connect on the same kind of do you do you rate this that pizza looks like it would be a three to me and then he's like it's a yeah. seven and you're like oh right. you got me uh, I don't and that's the emotional that actually that actually part of that thing too mm -hmm. yes so that's what's happening with his it, it, you need to have an emotional purpose to it and you need to say something what he's saying is ultimately like these are my thoughts on pizza what are yours without actually saying it. Yeah. And he's getting you involved, which all media should get you involved. You should be in. That's why writing is necessary. It's necessary to be immersive because yeah. you're not telling the story around a fire. And even if you are, you have to bring emotion to it. They're reading the story, so they have to pull themselves through it. Your story can't pull them through it. it yeah. You know what? I'm Because if they're not connecting to it, it doesn't matter how amazing, awesome, and unique your story is. They'll put it down. They'll throw. They would rather throw it out then bring it to the library and you know what i'm saying because they're yeah. just not connecting on an emotional level and that's why some people say this book was amazing and other people say this was terrible and it's because right. they just didn't connect with it on an emotional level even though that's also self that's subconscious right you know some people might be like i hated this book but i couldn't put it down yeah and there's a reason you connected with it emotionally and your mind was like, I need, I need to know that this book is terrible. So I'm going to keep reading or I, I think I know it's going to get better or I need like, that. it's like playing the yeah. stock market or going to the casino. I could beat the machine, right? One, that one becomes one emotional. Fascinating experiences of this that I've had in, in recent memory. There's a film out. I think it went direct to Netflix. Maybe it had the theater run. I don't know. Called Hitman. Um, oh, and yeah. yeah I, it's been out long enough. I'm, I am. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. The ending of the movie for me was really, really satisfying. Like ultimately yeah. the good guy gets away with it and he gets to walk away scot-free. He gets the girl, he gets the thing. He's done these terrible things. He should have to pay his debt. 
he really should have to pay his debt, but instead he gets away and has a life. And that spoke to me, um, maybe even on a personal level, because I'm quite the screw up and I've made some mistakes in my life. And it feels thematic to me that I always pay in full. Like there's never been a time where someone's been like, hey, you screwed it. We're going to let you go on this one. Like I screwed it and you are paying in full and then in yeah. full again. You um, went too deep so, into the mud hole. <laughs> I went real deep into the mud. You said you were like elbow deep. Exactly. I was down to my shoulder. Um, <laughs> but so I think about that and, and that movie spoke to me. And I loved it. And so uh, my wife and I recommended it to my mother-in-law one day. We were all sitting at the, the lake. She watched it and she's like, I was just really angry that he he didn't have to serve as justice. And uh, I was thinking about, I know a lot of people who who like value justice. One of the most common themes I hear all the time is that we want uh, to be tough on criminals. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to be tough on criminals. There's a really big part of me that wants to like figure out how to create safety and yet not be tough on people because I feel like being tough on people doesn't produce good results. And this all really does tie into a story that I'm telling myself. You said terrible about Hitman before I had any information. So like you'd made your own decision about it, but you're right. There's something like the story that we're receiving matters a lot too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also would agree. Like, it's really great that the ending is there. I have no issue with that. My, my yeah. reason the story is terrible is on a whole other level. Uh, yeah. Um, however, uh, I also agree that, uh, we shouldn't have harsh, uh, penalties for criminals, but we yeah. should have harsh penalties for terrible people. And this is like <laughs> yes. a murderer should have harsh penalties for sure. Uh, and a, 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 a driving drunk and killing someone, you're a murderer. You're yeah, not, you're absolutely. not a drunk driver. Uh, you know, uh, anything that has to do with children, pedophilia, any of that. Right. Terrible. You know, but like if somebody Agreed. like steals because they're starving, write that off, yeah. you know, get your right. tax right off as a business. It's, it's, you know, it's a loss, you know, uh, we had a, a, <clears throat> a volleyball player here for Nebraska. Um, and, and their team is so great that like, they'll do anything they can to keep their, their kids out of trouble. She was, um, she was caught minor in possession of alcohol and got in trouble. Then very shortly after that, she got caught stealing bracelets from, um, some store here in town. Okay. And uh, like there were people calling for her to be expelled from the school and kicked off the team. And That's there were cool. a bunch of people who were like, we need her. She's so good. And I was like, the only conversation we should be having right now is how serious is it to steal bracelets? Let's have her pay back the bracelets. And then like maybe there needs to be some accountability held up for her to get her on the right path. But like Agreed. when my son comes home from school and he's been a jackass to his teacher all day. But like, yes, we take away Nintendo to try to like give him a, a consequence that matters to him. But, you know, we're not like going to ask for the teacher to expel him. Like we're going to try as hard as we can to provide something good. I know it feels like we've got far afield of like talking about creating stories, but this is actually these are the things I'm writing stories about is I'm trying to wrestle inside myself about these kind of themes. Like, is there a world where, yeah. you know, we, we balance justice with mercy? That's something that's really important to me right now. Yeah, that's why I waterboard my children when they misbehave. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm an excellent <laughs> parent. I only lost four. <laughs> yep. Uh, I have no children. For anyone who's listening, I, I am. I would not be a good parent. Um, but yeah, uh, if, if we could go back to Hitman real quick, just just to yeah, say why it's terrible, it's just uh, I think the story could be interesting. The ending was actually changed from the true story. Oh, okay. He didn't actually kill anybody. Like, ah. like it's a real person like you know he's a, yeah yeah he's a real person but they had to make it in they had to quote unquote make it interesting and that's okay. why i think the story is terrible because they had to make it interesting i they thought it was, could have been interesting on its merit of what mm. this was was happening but they were like there needs to be a conflict and there yeah. needs to be tension and it's like but there are other versions of tension and conflict that probably would be a little bit more interesting in that scenario than just being like murder cover up and yeah, you know what I'm saying? I, it's great that they got away with it, but getting to that point, it just seemed lazy. And that's, and it was just, it was paint by numbers. And then of course the production of it was like what it was, but again, it's very hard to get something made. Yeah. But at the same time, like put a little effort into the story. Like, you know, it's just, yeah. It was too convenient mm -hmm. how everything worked out. And to me, 
Uh, I'm not a fan of convenience. Uh, I think it's I think it's lazy writing. Uh, it's like why throw the monster in the room if you're not willing to work out the details to. to you can't throw the monster in the room and be like, Oh, there's a door right next to us. Let's leave the room. Yeah. You know, like th yeah. why put the monster there in the first place? Did you ever see matchstick men, Nick cage? Oh yeah. Yeah. That movie's great. great. Yeah. That movie's phenomenal. And that movie is, is the counterpart to Hitman. It's the, it's a very, very similar setup. You've got uh Nick cage's character. You've got the, the kid, you've got like the innocent party. Then you've got like the long-term partner, the best buddy and the double cross at the end of that movie is what makes the payoff so phenomenal. Cause you're like, Oh, I just got screwed in the head. Like somebody took a two by four to the side of my head. Um, I'd go a step further though, Jody, I'd say the reason that movie works is because the actual story is the characters and the relationship between Nick and yeah. his daughter. Right. Whereas in Hitman, well, and that, but, about yeah. them getting away with it. They didn't yeah, learn anything. Absolutely. No, and I'm okay with that though. That's that goes back to that idea that I'm playing with right now. I wouldn't say they didn't learn anything about it. I would say that they were not forced to learn by external pressures. To me, it felt like they learned through internal pressures, like what their relationship went through in Hitman. They come to this moment where they decide to come together and and whack a guy, you know, and then they get away with it. But that teaches them about each other and trust. So for me, it did work. And and I'm OK. Like, I actually didn't even know it was based on a true story. I'm probably like it probably says right at the front of the movie. And I just forgot. Um, oh. <laughs> but the the reason that the the betrayal works in Matchstick Man is exactly what you said. And I just didn't like walk it up to that line. But it's because this guy was a trusted guy who betrayed him that relationship, you never considered it because of the quality of their relationship. And if they hadn't yeah. done such a good job of building that friendship, you would not have been hurt by it. And so you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And in Hitman, I don't believe none of those relationships seem real to me. They just seem like yeah. causality, you know, like, well, this yeah. has to happen. This has to happen. Yeah. Uh, it's like the Ben Parker and Trey, uh, Trey Parker and Ben, uh, whatever the, the, the South Park people where they're like, yep. th this happens and then this happens and then this happens. Like that's all that movie is. It should be, this happens. Therefore mm -hmm. this happens, but this happens. And then this happens. Therefore th like it should, there yeah. should be a push, a pull and push to all writing. You know, if like, if, if you and I were characters, Right. We could easily just get through this podcast. Right. But yeah. that would be boring. There would have to be a point where we push and pull. It just yeah. would have to be because that's that's no one. The only re reason people are listening to us is either a right now they're interested in the topics, which might be writing or breaking down story or understanding. So they're getting something out of the solution. But to keep the intrigue. They we have to move, which we laughed a little. We did that right. So in a story, you have to put those kind of elements into it, even though those have nothing to do with the through line of what we're here to talk about, which is our writing process. We yeah. diverged as we would in any world, and that novels don't always do that. They just stick to this very firm. Yeah, not, not always, but some you know sometimes. I think so. Yeah. And it's like you have to diverge sometimes, but those di those divergences have to make sense narratively because your budget is word count. Right. You know, like in in a film, your budget is the eighth of a page. You know, yeah. like every page is every eighth of a page costs money, whereas yeah. with a book, your budget is the word count. So, is what I'm doing here worth the the word count? Did yep. I just spend 500 words on this? And is it worth it? Is it doing anything of substance or did I really describe the, the outside of the building that doesn't pay off, doesn't add to anything, but, but now we know what the room looks like. Yeah. But we don't need to know it's 10 by 10. It right. has wood floors. Why don't you say that she walked across the wooden floors and sat down on the cush couch that she sunk into. Now you describe yeah. the couch and the floor and it's through her experience. So it's character development and right. it's plot. We're moving the story along. So when I, this is something I just had a conversation with somebody about, and it matters a lot to me because I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I don't have answers for it, but the nine lives of Marvin along high is the first genre book I ever wrote. And I did it intentionally. I was like, I'm going to work in genre because I believe it's easier to sell commercial. And I'm at the point where I want to move in that direction yet. All of my sensibilities are literary. So 
um, Dennis Johnson, David Foster Wallace, Roberto Bolaño. Those are guys, uh, Marilyn Robinson, to throw a lady in there, are the people that I <laughs> learned how to create uh, characters from and fell in love with their characters. And so I think that my story has very much of a, a literary feel to it where I'm exploring character motivations, relationships, um, and the mystery is kind of like a um, secondary. And so I've been thinking lately, did I create this book that lives in two different worlds in kind of like the most unfortunate way where, you know, it sounds a little bit like Raymond Chandler. You can definitely tell I'm paying homage to him. Um, it's got a mystery in it. It's got a little bit of magic in it, but essentially it's a character driven story. And so your people who are reading genre are like, this is a little too slow moving for me. Um, I don't care about these relationships or these people. And yet, like people who are literary, and I can say this from experience, don't want anything to do with the book because it's genre. Um, and that's been something that I've been really frustrated by is that for everything we've talked about, expectations rule a lot. Now, this is not me blaming anybody else. This is me actually saying maybe I did a bad job because I wasn't really clear on what I wanted to accomplish. But um, it's. It, I think it can be frustrating to understand where your story fits and where it's going to be successful. My wife loves romances. I've read a few and enjoyed them, but it's not something I ever seek. Yeah, you're not like, you know what I need today? <laughs> I need to see these two guys go at it. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> she loves that, by the way. She loves gay romance. It's like her favorite. Yeah, it's it's the most sensual. It's, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I've heard. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt when the mud hole... Is <laughs> uh, because they're farmers. They're farmers. The mud holes because they're yeah, farmers. Absolutely. On, on broke yep. back farming. Yeah. Um, uh, I I would say, uh, and I'm not going to critique your book, you know, because there's no yep. reason to. But uh, I would say, in any genre choice, you shouldn't be writing genre, but you need to have elements of that genre in your story. But if you're writing right. genre, you're not writing story because you're like, let me. I'm not saying you again, royal you. You're, yeah. you, you as writers, if you're going, I'm going to write a romance, so I have to have the happy ending. I have to have the love scene. I have to have they will, they won't they. I have to have the meet cute. If you're writing that, it's like writing a black CEO, strong female character yeah. first without substance, right? Yeah. The, the yeah. thing that draws us to that story of that character is the substance, not the identity. Yep. Yeah. And you can't have a story without the substance. So what what would help any genre book is write the story that you want. For example, thriller, mystery, right? With your elements, but allow it to be its own story. And then go, do I have these elements in there because of the genre? Instead of right. going, I have to write to these elements. Right. You know, um, there was a there's a there was a mystery book that I had to uh, develop uh, a couple months ago, and uh, they get to the investigation, and it's just people went off, and then they came back, and then the chapter was about discussing discussing the investigation. So we didn't get to see them processing yeah. and working through stuff, right? Because they just wanted to get through the investigation, right? So yeah, it's about an investigation, but where's the substance? The, right. the interesting part is how they work through a scene and what they're thinking. You know, imagine your character just went to a scene, looked at it, and then turned and goes, all right, uh, let's have a discussion about what I saw. Yeah. You know, and that's not as interesting as them moving through stuff. Like Sherlock Holmes, the movie, if you like it or not, you know, Guy Ritchie, uh, you know, yep. um, Robert Downey Jr., he's like sniffing frogs and licking things and walking through a room. And at first you an average viewer might be like, what is he doing? You yeah. know? And then as Watson is just talking to him and they're just having a casual conversation. We're walking through a room and then you, it breaks down his process later. Right. Yeah. I, you can't do what you can in a book, in a book, it probably would internalize what he's processing, you know, like how he's like tasting it. And well, you know, like it would be immersed in what he's tasting. Like we yeah. can't do that in a movie. So, it's a because it's a visual medium, but if you read Sherlock Holmes books, by the way, they are never written and even closely written to how Sherlock is usually portrayed in uh in right modern media. He's not portrayed, per, portrayed as an a hole and uh yeah. eccentric like that, but anyway, in the books, just like in Jack Reacher, 
we get the we get to feel how he processes it, and that's yep. the interesting part. Uh, I and I think that's what made the first Jack Reacher movie with Tom Cruise interesting is we got to see him investigate. We got to yep. see him working things out, and then the second one it was an action film. Yeah, you know, at least that's that's, that's what Tom Cruise does. He does action. That's his thing. He's like, I'm in. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna run. Yeah. I'm gonna go. To, and then what? And then, boom. Yeah. <laughs> You, at some point in every Tom Cruise movie, you will see him running balls to the wall as hard as he can. It always happens. It's Tom Cruise run. You need it. It's in his contract, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and if you're allowed to run with him, it, it's like uh, it's supposed to be a big deal. Like if, if he lets you run with him. Wow. Like it's supposed to be like you earn something like, oh, he's like, oh, yeah, let's do it. You know, and Jake yeah. Johnson got to run with him in the uh, the mummy. Uh, uh, terrible movie. Um, again. <laughs> that's an example of lots of stuff is happening, but nothing is happening. Yeah. There's causality yeah. and stuff like that. And we, you know, this go leads to this, but it is a lot of this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens. Like let's get Jack on Hyde and Tom Cruise the fight, you yeah. know, and let's get the mummy and then the mummy does the Rawr! like, yeah, I, I, I have always been a fan of like good versus evil. Don't get me wrong. Like I grew up, in a time where like every eighties fantasy book was good versus evil, you know? Yeah. You know? Right. But again, some of my favorite books were like the black, the black rose, you know, mm -hmm. or, uh, or Lord Soth or, you know, where it's like this character becomes evil. And I love seeing the villain story, like yeah. them becoming evil. And like, that's why I like Dexter, or at least the first couple of seasons, because yeah. you're getting to move through this villain's mindset and we like him, but he's a terrible person. Like he is a murderer, you right. know, like not just a murderer, a serial killer. And he's, yeah. he's a sociopath, you know? So I do like that element. Um, but I found in my writing career, I've always leaned more towards not, I don't want to use morally gray because I kind of actually don't like that term, but I write characters that make human choices and wherever that leads them, it leads them. And uh, I've always, I've always tried to make them also react to the emotional truth of something. You know, you yeah. ever watch like a, a movie or read a book and, you know, they just killed like 10 people because they're trying to get to the top level to fight the big bad. Right. And they're not even affected emotionally by the fact that they just murdered 10 people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like if I don't know why we rarely see characters. Don't get me wrong. Like a Jamie Lannister, you know, you know he grew up in war. We didn't get to see him grow up through war. We right. didn't get to see him grow up. Learn Like he's already experienced death. Uh, you know, like my father would say, uh, uh, he never killed anyone in Vietnam, but he's like, if I had, you know, there's a certain point where you're no longer killing people. You're just saving You're you're surviving. Right. You know? And, but like when you're journey when you're following a character that is experiencing death for the first time, like John Wick, we're not expecting him to go, Oh, I just killed 17 people. Oh my god. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, but you know, if they're a 16 year old character or even 18 or 20 and they're in war or they're they just saved themselves because their house was invaded and they had to kill the person, or they finally get to the serial killer and they find they're avenging the, the husband's death and uh, they finally fight through it and kill, and then they're afterwards like, "Oh yeah, I killed them." No, where's the fallout? Right. Give me fallout. That's all I ask. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't know. I'm crazy with this. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're crazy with it. I had a thought while you were talking about, um, like, it seems to me that there are different people with different orientations toward what they're expecting. And I think the reason that Jack Reacher does so well is that there's a huge swath of the population that wants the action film. They want, they, 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 there's, there's no regard for character development. There is a real hunger and thirst for a kick-ass dude to come in and take care of business. And if, if it's all loosely strung together, like they're going to be happy. I think some of that started happening with the Marvel movies now, clearly wait, wait, storytelling... wait, 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 further. We'll, we'll go to the Marvel thing, but I just want yeah, to, yeah. the second Jack Reacher is the reason they stopped doing the films because they went, they stepped away from the style of the right. book. The yeah. fan base is about the investigation. They sure. love, that's why the first season was really good because he's investigating. The second yeah. season leaned a little bit more towards ensemble action, 
Yeah. That's not what Jack Reacher is about. Those books sell because they are like your books, mystery. They're an investigation. They're yeah. solving it. So, but, uh, go, uh, but go on. I, I think you're making a great point with the Marvel where they're turning into more action based and not necessarily character based. Yeah. And it's, I, it's not necessarily helping them there either. So I think too, you're making a good point, but I, I mean like expendables or anything like that. Where well, expendable, like, you're going in to see Freddie and Jason kill people. That's what expendables are, except it's right, action. Exactly. You're not yeah. going in there to going Shawshank. Let's do it. You know, like, right, exactly. But that's what I'm thinking about is that I think, I think some of the things that do the best, you'll always find critics of them who are like, hey, this is barely even a story. Um, <laughs> this is this is really just a spectacle. Um, and people get angry at that. But I think that those things like the, the spectacle does really well. Um, I don't know that I'm capable of doing the spectacle, but sometimes I'm, I'm a little bit afraid that I'm not like able to do the story either. Uh not really. These are these are my deep insecurities. Like my insecurity is, is that I like to do a little bit of spectacle and I like to do a little bit of story um, and I like to do a lot of experimenting. I am a big fan of off the cuff, those kind of things. Yeah. And. Yeah, sometimes sometimes it's like I don't even know where I fit or why I like the things I do. Why did I like the happening? I'm not sure why I liked the happening. But I did. I enjoyed it as a movie, and I have no defense of that except it was pleasing to watch. Yeah, and you can nap and not be disturbed by that movie. <laughs> uh, well, well, two things. The first one is like there is a such thing as a Transformers film where you're not going in for substance. Like, and if you do go in there, going, oh, man, there was just no movement of character. Like yeah. you're you chose to watch the wrong movie. You like. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But then if I went to see something like Shawshank Redemption and I was like, you know, why is this so good? I, I wish it was just robots, you know, like you got to know what you're going into. But um, yeah. I, I'm going to say this about because, uh, you know, I've read your books or at least one of them. I have the next one coming. Uh, yes, you do. This is not a knock on your writing. But you said something about I hope I'm writing story. So I'm I'm specifically addressing that. Yeah. Your books are on the cusp of the story. I'm not I am not saying that in a negative way. I'm not saying that in a negative way. There, it, your stories are are very plot driven and rightfully so. It is a yeah thriller slash investigation. Uh, if this helps you and anyone else who's reading. This is my, how I define it, and it helps me not only write, but it has helped me, especially in the industry when it comes to like screenplays and stuff like that. Think of every manuscript or every script you approach as a narrative, and the narrative is broken up into two parts, plot and story. Plot is what needs to happen. It, it, no matter what, these things are going to play themselves out, and those plot points have to happen uh not because it's meant to happen, but because it is a reaction to what has happened. And as long as you keep doing that, it'll develop itself and right. connect. Story is how the narrative plays out through the emotional experience of the POV. Right. And that has to do a lot more with character choices, their positions on things, those positions being challenged, uh, and sometimes those positions are changed completely somewhat or not at all. If they are not changed at all, then they double down, which in turn is a quote unquote change, but their behavior towards it is they're becoming, you know, like I, my stance on this is, you know, um, but they could be as small as I like the giants versus you like the jets, or it could be as big as I'm for abortion. I'm not for abortion. Like it could be, those are positions, right? Yeah. Uh, and then how they react to that. And then finally, but mo more importantly, uh, uh, a character needs to experience, as we said, the fallout. They need to have a return on their involvement. If you could do, not you in general, but like if people as yeah. writers can do these things, uh, it will elevate your narrative to another level because we, we understand the plot is interesting, but there are only seven stories you could tell in this world. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the story is always going to be the unique part that is told through the writer's voice. But if you're just having them go through and I, and I'm not saying this in a negative way to any writer out there, 
But if the characters are going through the motion to get through the plot, the story is suffering. Yeah. I that's, mean, that's from, from, a, from a perspective of having written, I don't feel like that's the case with my book. I always knew that I wanted to explore, and I'm not actually saying you're saying these things to me. I'm trying to speak on that subject about like the way that I thought about the book. What was interesting to me was the tension between Luke and Lyle. Is like it's very clear to me that Luke loves Lyle and that Lyle loves Luke, but that neither of them knows that the other one loves each other. And so for me, that's kind of like the emotional thing. The things that they have to go through with each other to realize that they love each other. Um, the heartbreak of actually arriving at the moment where they know they love each other and then Lyle dies mm -hmm. and she loses now the yeah. ability for him to know. Like they both know at one point in the story that they love each other, but he dies. If I may. That. Yeah. That's plot. Tension is plot because it has to happen. The character has to die because it has to happen. Like those are things that have to happen. The story are the choices that are made through the tension because right. of the death. And not necessarily what led to the death. Like the death has to happen. So that has nothing to do with story. That is the plot is this character must die. And this character has to experience that. The story is how it unfolds through their choices of how they experience that moment. What? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I certainly am intending to talk about how though. That's, I guess what I'm saying is like the, the how of it, like the things that happen to them, they learn through those things that they love each other. So it's not the inevitability of the setup, which there that's, isn't. That's also the plot. They learn, they learn, the plot is they learn about themselves and how they love each other because this character died. Occasionally we speak different languages. We're right. Yes, yeah, that, that's why I defined it earlier. When I, when I'm talking about story yep. and plot story is literally the movement through the moment, not the moment itself. The, if you talk about a moment, it's plot. If you talk about, let's say, a, re a really great example of story and plot, all right? So plot is uh, you as a person uh, have to uh, go to the store and buy milk, okay? Uh, you, you don't have your money. You only have a credit card, okay? And you get there and you use the credit card and it doesn't work. And you're like, hey, I need this milk. And the, and, the, and the cashier gives you the milk. That's all plot. Even if I said there was right. a little, uh, they go there, the card doesn't work. That creates conflict, right? Because the card's not working and you need the milk. You need the milk for whatever to go home to. So you can't go home until you get the milk. That's conflict and tension. We're creating tension. Does the card work? Are they going to solve this problem? But that's still plot, right? And then they try to negotiate with the cashier uh, to get the milk. That's still tension and conflict, but it's still plot, right? And then they, the cashier eventually goes, all right, you know what? That's great. You can have the milk and it goes home. That was all plot. The story would be, hey, we got to get milk. Can you go get milk? And now your character has to have a position. Do they want to leave the house or do they want to focus on the Giants game? Because the Giants, they love the Giants. Or do they only kind of love the Giants? Do they have a relationship with their wife? So how do they react to this? Do they just get up and go, I'll get the milk? Or do we allow the story to unfold? I can get the milk, but could I get it later? I'm still in the fourth quarter. The game's almost over. Yeah, but you know that I need the milk because I have to do that, right? The plot is just that the milk has to be gotten. But the story now gets to play out that first choice, which is, can you go get milk? And now we play it out through the challenging of, I want to watch the game, but I need you to get the milk. I will happily get the milk, but you got to wait until the game is over. You got to give me 40 minutes and then I'll go get the milk. That's the first story beat is that it's playing out the I need you to go get milk plot. The, it's still tension. Plot is still I need you to get milk. And I might say he's going to be watching the football game. Now that's plot, which is still tension. But the choices and the way they discuss it and the dialogue they choose, maybe he chooses it to be emotionally kind. Maybe he's like, you know what, baby? I would definitely get the milk. But all I'm asking is, you know, I just got home and I, I missed the whole first three quarters of the game. I just want to watch the ending. And then the wife is like, you know what? That's fine. I don't need the milk right away. That story, we're, we're making them make choices and the way they play it out. That's all that is. That's, that's how I have defined it. 
you may define it differently, but I'm just right. Yeah, I I'm mean, explaining I, through the definitions that I, I understand. I, well, I understand what you're doing. I don't. I don't know that I actually understand the difference because I. I'm not 100% sure that I can visualize there being a story without there being a plot, nor can I envision there being a plot without a story. Um, well, I you can do imagine... need a the story is the choices they make. Plot right. is what needs to happen. I He's going to go get milk and they're going to fight is plot. So, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm afraid you're going to tell me these are both plot again, but at the end of the book, uh, Luke has the opportunity to take a, a draft of a medication that's going to basically kill her. She's yeah. making a choice to commit suicide with the expectation that she can go back and save Lyle. That's that's her hope. That's she doesn't plot. know what's going to happen. See, you're calling that plot, but I call that story. It's a choice. The story is the discussion that leads to her choosing it. Right. And I guess I'm assuming all of that, though, like she's in she's in the, the room with Debbie and they're talking about it. And Debbie's like, I have this thing for you. you. You are assuming it, but that's OK, because, again, I just gave the definitions and we're only discussing my definitions. We're not discussing what someone else might call. They might call it floop floom. We don't know. Sure. I, I, get, I get where you're. Well, I think I get where you're coming from. I'm saying I don't understand you. I'm saying that I'm, yeah. I'm lacking in understanding. Let me try um, to clear it up because we definitely have to call it because I, I have another I have a two thirty. but. Uh, all right. In that situation, she makes a choice to take the vial to, to right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. She, she, all right. Yeah. So the plot is she takes, she makes a choice to take the vial and she dies, right? Is, is that what happens? Um, you don't, you don't get quite that far. You know, she's made the choice to take it, but she doesn't die that you see on the page. It ends with her making the decision to have. Oh, okay. So we're just talking about, she takes a choice and she takes a choice because she wants to save the guy's life. Yeah. All right, so the plot is she's making the choice to save the guy's life. The story would be the discussion they have. That's all that story is. The story is the actual play, how it plays out on the page. So if she's yeah. like, the story would be her going, I'm taking the vial. That's her position. She has now defined her position. I'm going to take it because I want to survive you. That's does a day have a story in your opinion? What? Like, is, is, does a day have a story? Does uh, like Does our podcast have a story and a plot or is this just story? Um, I know you, you know, got to go doing right now. Yes, right. Well, the plot is we are going to do a podcast and we're going to talk about subjects A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Yeah. The story is our discussion, is yeah. the actual discussion. Yeah. So, how you're saying like you don't understand what plot and story is, that's us playing out the story because you're actually pushing back. So the pushback is challenging my yeah. position of my definition and your and understanding of it. By the very actions of it becomes the plot. So the story no, it is becomes the, the, st the story is the play is our actual discussion. The plot is that we discuss it. The plot is that we have to discuss it and that they yeah. do discuss it. The story are the words we use to get through the discussion. The team has to play football. Yep. Right? And the Giants will beat the Jets just because that's how it is. That's plot. Now, if we watch the whole game, the entire game plays out, that's story. So watching the plays happen, watching people get hit, watching people. Yep. That's the, the story is watching the thing play out. The plot is that uh, the Giants will score a touchdown on their third play. Uh, the Jets will score a touchdown in their sixth play. Uh, right. It'll be close by the end of the game. And the quarterback makes the decision to run it and score the final winning touchdown. That's all plot, right? But why does he choose to do that is a conversation that is either worked out in his head that we experience, which becomes the story because we're seeing him make choices. We're, we're hearing him think out and play out process, uh, things like that. Does that make sense? Well, if you would have if you would have told me that the game clock was the plot and that the action on the field was the story, I no, would have the, understood you. But no, the get the clock is the bomb. The time the bomb has been set. That's a that's a writing rule. So the bomb has been set. So they yeah. have a time limit. So if we don't do this by so and so, so and so dies because the poison will go through them. That's the t the bomb has been set. Right. That's that's a Hitchcock rule. Um, that yeah. creates attention because we know. But if you say they're going to play a game and they have to play the game and the Giants have to win or they do win because the quarterback makes a final sacrifice play and wins the gets hurt while making the final touchdown and they win the game. 
Yep. That's all plot on the page. We did not see that unfold. You could literally list that out like an outline. You could be like, they're going to play a game. Uh, they're going to get all the way to the last right. couple of minutes and it's going to be tied. The quarterback's going to make a sacrifice play and end up getting hurt while jumping into the, the thing and winning the game. Right. That's all plot. But now mm -hmm. when you're writing it on the page, the thing that makes it story is the pushback to ideas, the choices, the consequences and the emotional yep. investment in how characters are dealing with things. If, if on the page it goes, she walks through the room and sees her boyfriend sitting on the chair. What are you doing here? Oh, I, I'm, I'm waiting for you because we have to go into the next room. And then she goes, all right, well, how long have you been waiting for? Oh, just a couple minutes. All right, well, let's go to the next room. Nothing happened there but plot. That No story happened because there was no pushback. There was no emotion. There was no, we don't know if she was upset. We don't know if he was upset. We don't like we didn't experience the moment. We only witnessed the plot unfold. Hmm. He's in the room. She has to see him in the room. They have to exposition how long it's been. And hmm. then what are they doing next? So it does have a setup. It does have a midpoint conflict, which is how long have you been here? That's the conflict. And yep. then the resolve is ah, a couple minutes, but we got to get to the next room. So that's just plot on the page. The emotion or the story would be like, how'd you get here before me? You know, and they're like, oh, well, you took forever and I and I didn't want to wait anymore. Well, that's yeah. we're arguing position. And now what do you mean you didn't want to wait for? I was waiting for you. We're pushing back on their position, which is I'm the one who is on time. You're late. And that story, because that creates the actual tension, which on the plot might say they have tension between them. Yeah. Plot is they have tension. They have a moment of tension between them and they argue who should have been there first. That's plot. But then what words are they choosing? How are they choosing to defend their positions? Watching that play out is the story. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, well, I, I guess so. I mean, still to me, I'm, I'm not seeing like, I, I guess I'm going back to that idea of like, you can't have plot points um, without story, but you can't have story without plot points. And so like, I guess I keep going back to the idea of like, Yes, the plot is she takes the vial of the the medicine or whatever. Yeah. But like clearly on the page, like she's thinking through it. They're having a discussion, like all those things are happening. I don't know how to talk about the two things without intermingling them. I it's it's okay. uh, yeah. yeah, it's a little bit like um, you know, I'm a man and I have elevated levels of testosterone. Um, uh, you know, like <laughs> I don't it's know. All all I'm saying is sometimes there are things happening on the page. Mm -hmm but nothing is happening and then nothing and is happening. Yep. Is, uh, um, nothing is happening because it is not playing out through right. the characters. It's just playing out because yes, exactly. Like it. the exposition that you were talking about, you've got, you've got the exposition and that in and in of itself is not actually action. It's a summary summary of, of what happened, which I think that there are great moments in every story where you need exposition to just move the thing forward. And then but you stop. Even and exposition have could be story. You just have to play it through the emotional or choices or positions of the characters. If I need to take the vial, right? The exposition is ultimately what is this? What are the consequences if I take this? I'll die. So I right. want to choose. I'm going to take this so you don't die, right? It's going to kill you, though. I know. That's all exposition. That's not story. Yeah. That is all exposition. The story would be maybe internally the character's like, I mean, externally the character goes, I'm going I I don't want you to die. I'm taking this vial. And then internally they might be like, I don't want to take this, but it, but he has a child. You know, you know, but I have to do this is the thing that has to go. He, he, he has more to live for, but she doesn't want that the guy to know, right. so she doesn't say that. Now that story, because it's playing out through she's challenging her yep. own position. And then maybe she goes, it's the only way. And now we understand the subtext that she's saying. And he's like, it's not the only way. You don't have to do this. Let me do it. You know, and now he's challenging her position. So it's playing yep. out. That's the story. But if she's like, I don't saying this is what's happening, but if a character goes in and goes, Oh, you're going to die if you take the poison. I will take the poison because you have a kid and I, I don't, and you have more to live for. Now that's just yeah. plot because it's, we're not 
playing through the challenging of the, and especially if he goes, if he just goes, no, 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 I, you can't take it. I, let me take it. No, I'm going to take it. No, you yeah. can't take it. I, you have to live. Let me, they're not, nothing is happening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a conversation I have with my kids every day. Yes. No, yes. No, we're not going to do this guys. We're not doing it. What do you mean? I can't paint with poop. Yeah, exactly. Mud holes. Buttholes. Uh, listen, I do have to go, uh, Jody. As always, a pleasure to have you on the screen and on the Thank on you. the phone and on the show. Uh, how do people find you? I am at www.jodyjsperling.com. You can find me on all social media at Jody J. Sperling. And for anyone who's just listening to audio, even though everything will be in the descriptions below, uh, Jody is J O D Y, and then the letter J, and then his last name Sperling is S P E R. L I N G. And uh, well, I believe it's pronounced dot com uh, <laughs> for the extension. <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Uh, Jody Sperling, thank you very much for uh, coming on and being a part of it. Thank show. you. Love talking to you, man. Thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. To everyone else, uh, you know, truth in action, peace and harmony. And as always, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Bye.